welcome. Today we're going to discuss yet another famous person in history. Let's take a look at the man whose life earned him the honor of being the face of a whole line of rum. I worked in a liquor store for about a year in college and never even considered the fact that Captain Morgan could be named after a real person, but it was, and his name was Sir Henry Morgan. Not much is known for sure about his earlier life, but it's estimated he was born around 1635 in Wales. While we don't know who his parents are, we know he had two uncles who ranked high in the military. Later on in life, Morgan said that he left school early as he had always uh, had much more used the pike than the book. It is also unknown how exactly he wound up in the Caribbean, despite this being where he would make his name as a privateer. There are two more popular theories. The first is that he was in the company of a fleet commanded by Robert Venables that was ordered to head to the West Indies and create trouble with the Spanish during the Anglo-Spanish War. This is actually when Jamaica was captured and it would remain a British colony for over 300 years, although the project as a whole was considered a failure. The other is sometimes discounted because it was written in a biography about Sir Henry Morgan and was written by Alexandre Esquimalon. This guy was a surgeon on Morgan's ship and didn't like him at all. Therefore, the entire biography seemed to paint him in the worst light possible. Morgan actually ended up suing him after the biography came out, and he was forced to redact a lot of what was said, including this claim. According to Esquimalon, Morgan made his way to the Caribbean after being kidnapped. This admittedly makes less sense considering his rise to power. Had he been kidnapped and forced to work as a slave, he very likely wouldn't have had the opportunities that he did. We'll go with the first version where he was part of the fleet that captures Jamaica in 1654. So from here, he started to make a name for himself as a common soldier and then as a respected sailor. It's said that he wanted to follow in the footsteps of his high-ranking military uncles and this was his way of doing so. Sometime after capturing Jamaica, he joined up with Sir Christopher Mingus, who taught Morgan all he could about sailing and privateering. In 1660, Henry's uncle Edward was appointed the Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica. This may have been a contributing factor to him finally becoming a captain of his first privateering ship in 1662. For the next few years, Morgan continued raiding and plundering in the Caribbean, causing a lot of trouble for the Spanish. If you're thinking, wow, he sounds a lot like a pirate. Well, you aren't wrong. A privateer was basically a legal pirate. They were given permission by their respective governments to raid and attack the enemy on their behalf, and they get to keep part of what they plundered. This was a common practice for countries like Spain and Britain. By 1665, he had gained quite a name for himself and had started living a very comfortable life. He was already pretty wealthy and even had sugar plantations on Jamaica, further adding to his wealth and status. In 1665, he married his uncle Edward's daughter, Mary Elizabeth Morgan. I wish I knew what was up with casual incest back then. Shortly after this, in 1666, he was made the Colonel of the Port Royal Militia and was in charge of the defense of Jamaica. Even though he had already earned a name for himself, he was really just getting started. In 1667, the governor of Jamaica, Sir Thomas Modiford, issued a letter of mark to Morgan, telling him to gather the English privateers and once again go after the Spanish, to include taking prisoners. A letter of bark is basically what made privateers legal pirates because their actions were sanctioned by the crown. This particular order authorized attacking ships at sea and plundering their cargo, but did not allow attacking on land. More on that in a moment. Shortly after this, he was elected admiral by his fellow privateers, and in January 1668, he had 10 ships and 500 men ready to fulfill the duties put forth. His first stop was initially Havana, but he switched to Port-au-Prince after realizing that Havana was ready to go and wouldn't be taken easily. Port-au-Prince, on the other hand, was in fact taken easily, according to Escamillon. The spoils were less than they had hoped for. Morgan reported back to the governor that there were 70 men in Port-au-Prince planning on attacking Jamaica, thus explaining the reasoning for attacking on land, which was not permitted by the mark given. Eager to get some more loot, he planned his next attack. It would take place at the highly fortified, but also highly lucrative city, Portobello. 
Because there was so much trade coming and going and so much money to be made, the city was protected by two castles in the harbor and a third castle in town. Morgan wouldn't be deterred and on July 11, 1668, he transferred his men to canoes and approached one of the castles in the harbor before the sun came up. According to Escamillon, Morgan had ladders constructed that were wide enough for three men to climb side by side, and using these was how he was able to take the third castle. He also says that Morgan used religious men and women as human shields to aid in his attack of the third castle, but this was another claim that was redacted after Morgan sued him. Either way, Portobello was taken quickly with only 18 casualties and 32 wounded on Morgan's side. Morgan then wrote to the acting president of Panama, Don Augustin, demanding the ransom of 350,000 pesos for the city. Augustin attempted to retake the city by force, but his 800 men were repelled, and he ended up negotiating the ransom to a fraction of the original demand at 100,000 pesos. As he had again overstepped his letter of mark by attacking on land, Modiford had to pretend he rebuked him for this, although nothing actually happened. After all, he received 10% of the loot, while Morgan received 5%, and every privateer received 120 pounds. This may not sound like a lot, but that was actually five to six times their average annual earnings. This is probably one of my favorite stories about Captain Morgan. It starts with a near-death experience. So shortly after returning to Port Royal after his adventures at Portobello, Morgan decided to again head out with his initial target being Cartagena de Indias, which was the most wealthy Spanish settlement in the area. Modiford sent reinforcements in the form of a ship named the Oxford. On January 2nd, 1669, all of the captains sat down with Morgan aboard the Oxford. During this meeting, an explosion went off that killed a man instantly and resulted in Morgan and another captain being thrown into the water. He was that close to death. Now that the Oxford was down for the count, Morgan had to once again change his plans and focused on Maracaibo. The fort was undermanned and was easily taken by him and his men. What they weren't expecting was the surprise that the town was actually abandoned with some of the residents having fled to the jungle. He and his crew spent three weeks digging up what they could find as well as torturing residents for the location of any hidden treasures. After they had squeezed out what they could, they headed across the lake to La Ceiba, planning to do the exact same thing there. The taking of the fort was a little trickier this time, but was accomplished with Morgan and his crew, again using canoes to sneak their way into the fort. Things got even more difficult for them when a Spanish armada moved in and blocked their way out into the sea. The leader of the armada ended up demanding that Morgan leave behind the plunder and slaves that they had taken in exchange for passage out. Morgan's crew voted to instead fight their way out. Despite being heavily outgunned, and the Spanish had already retaken the fort. They were going to need an ingenious plan to get out of the situation alive. So that's just what they came up with. They ended up taking one of the ships that was found in La Ciba's port, the Magdalene, and they set it on fire and then sent it sailing towards the Spanish Armada. The ship was even complete with logs topped with headwear to make it look like a fully manned ship and holes were cut out in the side to give the appearance of more firepower than there really was. The ship sailed right into the Spanish flagship, and the leader of the armada and his crew were forced to jump ship. Not long after, a second ship caught on fire, and then the third was shot down by Morgan. The only thing now blocking their exit were the retaken forts. After getting a large payment from the people of Maracaibo to prevent the privateers from coming back, they needed yet another plan to outsmart their opponents. After noticing that the fort was prepared for a sea assault, Morgan acted like he was going to land so that the Spanish would flood from the fort to the land. As soon as this was done, Morgan and his crew snuck right by at night and out into the open sea. Everything about this story shows just how cunning Morgan was and that it wasn't all brawn, but brains as well. Not long after, he was made commander-in-chief of all Jamaican forces. By 1670, he had 36 ships and 1,800 men under his command. This was a huge jump from where he was at the beginning of 1668, with only 10 ships and 500 men. These resources would come in handy when he was again given a letter of mark that gave him free reign to do what he needed. 
This set him on a path of more looting and more destruction. On January 9, 1671, they were headed toward Old Panama City, where the governor was waiting with some Spanish troops. Morgan and his crew eventually switched to canoes and fought off the attackers until finally making it to the city on January 27th. Unfortunately, even more troops, as well as a hefty amount of cavalry, were waiting for them. Here we see another smart play by Morgan as he did a little cat and mouse game. He sent a few hundred men into a ravine, with Spanish troops following close after. He then attacked the pursuing Spanish troops. In an attempt to stave off the onslaught, the governor of Old Panama City let out bulls and oxen, but his plan backfired when they ended up heading straight for his own men. The governor ended up just setting the city on fire instead of giving it up to Morgan, and this resulted in a far lower take than what was expected especially for all the trouble that they had just gone through. Unbeknownst to Morgan at the time that this was happening, the English had actually already signed a peace treaty with Spain about a year prior. This meant that the entire attack, at the capital no less, was a blatant disregard of the treaty, despite the fact that Morgan wasn't even aware of it. Morgan was eventually recalled to London in April 1672. This was only done to appease the Spanish, as the English actually considered him a hero for his work. He was even knighted in 1674 and sent back to Jamaica, where he became lieutenant governor as well as lieutenant general. Although piracy was outlawed in the area, he still found a way to line his pockets by demanding tribute at the dock at Port Royal, or finding a roundabout way of issuing letters of mark to obtain a cut of the plunder. During this time, he began drinking heavily and his health began to decline. Things only got worse when he was replaced by Sir Thomas Lynch. In 1684, Exclamon's biography about him came out and it was then that Morgan sued him and ended up receiving $200 in payment. He died a few years later on August 25th, 1688. He was laid to rest with a state funeral featuring a 22 gun salute. Fellow privateers were also able to attend without fear of being captured. Fittingly, an earthquake occurred in 1692 that caused his grave to fall into the sea where it was never recovered. Captain Morgan rum began being produced in 1944, and it was sold to a different company in 2001 who set up a distillery in the Virgin Islands several years later. There have been 21 varieties of Captain Morgan, including original spiced, Loco Nut, and their newest version, Tiki. The range is large enough to appeal to a huge variety of people. It's such a well-known brand throughout the world, and I was so interested to find out that Captain Morgan was a real captain worthy of such a line of rum. Hopefully you enjoyed learning about the man behind the label. Thank you for joining me, and I'll catch you later. Alexandre Excumelin. and was written by Alexandre Escamillon. According to Escamillon, Escamillon. Fuck!